incredible pleasure to introduce to you my colleague and friend, Courtney Bankers. She was not yet 30 when she was named head coach of the Princeton women's basketball team in 2007. She did indeed take a team from 7 and 23 in her first year to 25 and 5 and three Ivy League championships in five years. She's had remarkable stability among her staff and her former players turn up for games at home and on the road with incredible loyalty and spirit. In the coaching business, those are all measures of leadership and success. I was trying to think of a few adjectives to describe Courtney, so I turned first to my resident sage. And as a 16-year-old girl, she can be scathingly frank <laughs> and painfully insightful. And she said without missing a beat, Courtney's passionate and warm. And then she said, that's a really good combination for a coach mom because if she was just passionate, she'd be too intense. And if she was just warm, she'd be too laid back. Then I asked my resident jock, my husband, a former college athlete, high school co and college coach, and he said, Courtney always brings her A game. That leaves me. And what would I say? Courtney's always fully engaged. Her entire being is devoted to whatever she's doing. And that kind of focus, persistence, commitment, and stamina defines her as a coach, a teacher, and a friend. And she's about to tell you how she does it. So I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, wow. Princeton's winningest women's basketball coach. Sure. You should come here more often. I get a free meal. I get to know how great I am. This is not the treatment I get at home. Um, first of all, I want to really thank the Princeton crew for coming. My staff had to be here because I told them to. Um, but the rest of uh, the Princeton community didn't have to be. And I certainly appreciate you, your support. Um, I've been to two of these lunches before, actually. Um, the first one was with uh, Vivian Stringer, the coach at Rutgers, and, and the second one was with Coach Hurley, um, both of whom are in the Hall of Fame. So clearly you guys are getting a little bit low on the pile, and I, I, fortunately I'm quite comfortable at the bottom of the pile, so and I'm really glad, to, really glad to be here. So I knew that this group, unfortunately the problem with being here before is that I knew this type of group, uh, the eclectic, um, energy and success uh, and intelligence in this room, I knew it was going to be humbling right away. So I did what I often do, and I have no idea what else to do, is I reach out to my um, friend and my current team's faculty fellow, Karen Giserni. And I sent her an email, and I said, okay, yeah, I'm happy to do it, but what do I say? What is that group of significance um, going to want to hear from someone like me? And uh, she told me they'd want to hear basically about how I lead and how my staff and I have created a culture of excellence at Princeton. Next 30 minutes, I hope, I'm, I hope I follow KJ's advice to a T. That has served me well. Um, and I hope at some point I move from the bottom of the pile to someone who at least earned their lunch. Um, so basically, people, how I started with is that people in inherently want to be a part of something great, both within our program and in the workforce. Uh, and that's the guiding principle of, of my leadership. Uh, that's my intent. Uh, and that's how I coach my program. We, 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 we and myself dare to dream. Uh, dare to be great, and we're willing to work to get there. So I'll give you a little bit about my background. Um, athletics has always been my interest. Um, my first word was not mom, it was not dad, it was ball. Um, I just never believed it could be a vocation. Um, and so I loved all sports growing up. Uh, you name it, I tried it. I settled on soccer, basketball, and tennis. And all were very good to me, and thankfully I was pretty good at them. Uh, everyone in New Hampshire plays soccer year-round, at least when you're, you know, I'm 34, so that many years ago, everyone played whether you like it or not. So that's what I did. Um, I was offered uh, many scholarships, and I sort of just rode with it, you know, like you sort of do when you have no idea what else to do. So I took my college visits, and I ended up with two. I was going to either go to Boston College or Notre Dame. Uh, both are great schools. Both are national powerhouses. Uh, importantly to my parents, both were free. Uh, the, the, so I remember sitting with my dad, and I said, Dad, you know, we gotta, which, which can we project is going to be the best program? I'd like to win a national championship. And he said, you know, Quartz, you've got it all wrong. And I was like, here we go again. So I was a life lesson with my dad. And he said, you, you got it all wrong. You're looking for the best program. What, you're, what you should be looking for is use your sport talent to go to the best school. I immediately rolled my eyes um, and thought, well, I'll go visit Dartmouth. It's the closest trip. It's the closest to my house. I'm from New Hampshire originally. So I went to visit Dartmouth, um, and Steve Swanson, who was a soccer coach there, and I had a really good relationship. Um, so I had sort of settled on, maybe I'll go to Dartmouth. Fine, Dad, it's expensive, but it's your fault now. <laughs> <laughs> so there I go. Um, so I was down to basically go play soccer at Dartmouth, and then he, I got a call from him about, about two weeks before my signing date uh, for the other scholarships, and he had said, 
I'm actually taking the Stanford job. So now I've added to your list. You can come to Stanford, or you can um, stay on at Dartmouth. And I said, or I can just call the Dartmouth basketball coach, see what she's up to. So that's what I did, and I ended up playing basketball at Dartmouth. Uh, we, we, uh, that's how random my life is. I have a neuroscience undergraduate degree, I have a writing master's, and I wear warm-up pants every day to work. <laughs> so here I do, I graduate from college, and I've got to find a, a life, basically. And you know, when you go to a school like Dartmouth, everybody is doing three things. They're making money, they're making money, or they're making money. And then I don't have a job. So that's not good for the making money aspect. Um, so I got offered to run a basketball program in, a, in Washington, D.C. at a high school, um, Episcopal High School, um, to which I said, well, first I, got, I was going to play professional basketball, and my mom was like, enough. <laughs> I will not, you're, you know, professional season is fine, and college has been fine and all that, but you need to join the workforce, because I don't know what they pay over there, but you're, you're, the credit card is gone. So I didn't even get to experience what that might have looked like, because I had to go to work. Um, so I got offered to coach basketball at Episcopal, and I literally, my exact line was, I am not going down to Washington, D.C. to coach basketball. So again, I thought coaching wasn't going to be a vocation. I said, but wait a minute, I don't have any other job offers. I should probably look around. I said, can I teach? Um, is there anything I can teach? And they said, well, we don't really have any teaching availability, but we do have an assistant athletic directing spot, and she's leaving at the end of the year, and if it goes well, you could probably become a girls' athletic director there. I said, great, can I teach? because I have an Ivy degree I should be teaching, right? People do. Um, well, fortunately, I worked my way in. I got to teach biology to freshmen, and I was a, became a, an athletic director at, age, at the age of 22, uh, and I did coach basketball. <laughs> so after my second year there, the Dartmouth uh, head coach who I played asked me to come back and be an assistant. I said, I couldn't be happier here, but I'm so I'm not going. At, after the third year, she asked me again and said, I, you know, I think you would we'd love to have you back. And I said, that's when I really thought about it, and I said, you know what, I either am a happy idiot, which is what my mom would say is the actual answer, but either I'm a happy idiot or I found my dream job at, you know, 23. And I need to figure out at this point whether, which one makes sense. So I said, I'll go and be an assistant as long as you pay for my master's. Because again, I didn't think that coaching was a vocation. So in the span of one week, four years later, I defended my thesis, which was an oral history on sport leadership. I turned 29. I filled out an application with my brother to join the amazing race. And I took a call from the athletic director at Princeton, Gary Walters. Uh, and I, uh, within that week, I was the head coach at Princeton. Wow. So now at 34, I have to say, I'm proud to say, I've never received a paycheck for anything besides coaching. <laughs> <laughs> so through my journey of following my heart and really tied to my warm-up pants, um, <laughs> I've, I've learned that coaching is teaching. Uh, and they both require leadership. Uh, leadership with purpose, leadership with clear communication, uh, and both involve creating culture. They provide, coaching provides a platform where I can, uh, I'm, not, I'm in a position to make a difference. Uh, I'm gonna read an excerpt from a book I read this summer called Inside Out Coaching uh, by Joe Ehrman, who's, if any football fans out there, he's a uh, very good professional football player. Uh, the dinner guests were sitting around the table discussing sports, education, and life. A successful businessman decided to explain the problem with education. He argued, and I quote, What's a kid going to learn from someone who decided their best option in life was to become a teacher or a coach? He reminded the other dinner guests what is often said about teachers and coaches. Quote, those who can, do. Those who can't, teach or coach. But, um, to stress his point, he said to another guest, you're a teacher and a coach, Bob. Be honest, what do you make? Bob, who had a reputation for frankness, replied, you want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I make them push through self-imposed limitations, both academically and athletically. I make them strive together and for each other. You want to know what I make? I make boys into men. I make them question. I make them self-critique. I make them aware of the social responsibility to build a better world. I make them competitive and teach them how to win with humility and to lose with honor. I make them understand that if you follow your heart and someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, you must, know, you must pay no attention because they just don't get it. Bob paused and then continued, you want to know what I make? I make a difference. What do you make? 